something. Oh, there we go. The webinar has started. And people are starting to come on in. So hi, everyone. Welcome to another Dorks. This week, the theme is space, which we are super excited about. Uh, and if you haven't been at a Dorks previously, just to sort of briefly catch you up, we have two short talks by speakers who have volunteered to chat with us. Uh, both of the talks today are on the theme of space. And so we'll hear a short talk, then we'll do a Q&A, then it'll be another short talk, and then another Q&A. If you have a question that you'd like to ask the speakers, you click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You'll submit a question and you can do this at any time, even when the speakers are talking, it shouldn't interrupt them. Uh, you will submit your question and we will uh, ask the questions during the Q&A sessions. So you'll be submitting the questions for Scott and I to ask. Uh, the chat box is disabled so that the speakers don't get distracted as we go. And yeah, we're excited that you're here and we're excited about the talks today. And each week uh, we start by having a drink that we share to try to have an experience that uh, sort of stimulates our senses in real life. I am here with my uh, daughter, Ada, who, what are you drinking, Ada? Um, I'm drinking hot cocoa and, um, and my dad wanted me to already try some before um we even got in because it was kind of overfilled that's right so i already know you it. already I drank like it. it all right excellent but I'm not dealing with it. okay uh i my job was to try out the mocktail for the week uh before i talk about the mocktail scott do you want to say hi to everyone and tell them about what you're drinking Sure. So, hey, everybody. My name's Scott Solomon. Um, so Kelly and I are the, the co-hosts of Dork. So welcome. Welcome back if you've been with us before and welcome to those that are new. So, um, yeah, every week we have both a mocktail and a cocktail. Uh, so this week I am trying the cocktail and the cocktail is called the Cosmonaut. I guess it's sort of a play on the Cosmopolitan. Um, so it's let's see. Let's see how it is. I haven't tried it yet. Whoa, okay, that's not quite what I expected, I have to say. Um, the, the cosmonaut is a little on the sour side. I may not have gotten the proportions right. It has, um, it's supposed to have a spoonful of raspberry preserves. I didn't have raspberry preserves, but I had strawberry and blackberry. So I just kind of did a little of both. Um, but it's also got lemon juice and gin, and I'm mostly tasting the lemon juice right now. So maybe I didn't get the proportions right. How's yours, Kelly? Uh, well, so real quick, Aaron, I saw you drinking something of a similar color. Are you also trying a Cosmonaut? Yes, I also tried a Cosmonaut. It's good. So did you didn't have did the you correct do it better glass, than I did. So, so I, I, oh, it's not going to show up, is it? I have my Apollo 12 commemorative juice glass. Awesome. <laughs> well, well played. It's good. So, yeah. So, I think and Oscar, are you drinking something? Sorry, Aaron, I... go ahead. Is it good? Okay. <laughs> no, I, I wasn't able to gather all the ingredients because I had car trouble yesterday. So oh, winter no. winter uh, is not the best weather for my truck. So <laughs> so yeah, um, I'm having good old fashioned water in the meantime. But I mean, <laughs> good for hydration. You know, and you if you were on the hydrated. moon, you would really appreciate that water, given that water is kind of rare there. You know, so appreciate it. Definitely. Uh, so I was supposed to be drinking the Martian Sunrise, but last night I realized that I was out of apple juice. And concurrent with realizing I was out of apple juice, our dandelion wine became acceptable to drink. Whoa. So I decided that I'm going to call my drink, which is a mix of dandelion wine and cranberry, the Ray Bradbury. So he wrote the Martian Chronicles and it has some cranberry, so Bradbury. And he also wrote a book called uh, Dandelion Wine. And so that seemed pretty fitting. Uh, and anyway, so this is our first ever attempt at making dandelion wine. And I, I have already tried it. It's pretty good. It's not, wow. I, I thought drinking dandelions would not be so great. It actually doesn't taste like dandelions at all. It just kind of gives it a little bit of a yellow flavor. We also put some oranges and lemon in there. And so it mostly tastes a little bit orangey and a little boozy. Mm. 
Uh, it's a little too sweet for me, but the cranberry juice being tart sort of offsets that a little. So anyway, the Ray Bradbury is great. And it seemed appropriate to me that we both or that, you know, that Scott and I and Aaron be drinking uh, alcoholic beverages because we're talking about space and I wanted to talk about the cosmonauts a little bit. So NASA has a pretty strict, you're not supposed to bring alcohol up into space policy, right, Aaron? And, and Correct. Aaron? But the Russians don't feel that strongly about that policy. And in fact, we found some, when we were doing our research, we found some early reports of physicians on the Russian side or the USSR side actually being like, well, drinking is, is good for you. It calms you down. It's got some other therapeutic, you know, whatever. And so it wasn't that rare for the cosmonauts to be drinking Armenian cognac, which was their, their drink of choice. And while we were doing our research, we found uh, stories about uh, oh shoot, one of the Americans who went up on Mir looked into one of the spacesuits and found uh, cognac hidden in one of the arms of the spacesuits. <laughs> and so, uh, anyway, there's this great book called Alcohol in Space by Chris Carberry, which has all these fun stories. Uh, but there has been some drinking on NASA's side also. Uh, after Apollo 11 landed, Buzz Aldrin took communion. So he drank a little bit of wine. So when uh, we first got on the moon, that was also when we had our first, our first drink in space that I know of that the Americans had uh, in space. So anyway, a little bit of space and alcohol history for everyone. Does anyone else have an alcohol in space story that they want to share? Yeah, I heard, I heard one the other day about um, Skylab. That actually Skylab, the original plan, meal plan included a little bit of wine. Uh, and then since NASA, like it's a public agency and these documents were public and stuff, there was a movement against astronauts having wine in space. So there was a, a movement that originated and some, you know, very uh, Puritan people say we're not going to spend tax money to send drunks into space and stuff like that. <laughs> so, so yeah, so wine is canceled. Yeah, yeah, that's so I interesting. Think it was, oh, sorry, go ahead, Scott. No, no, I was just saying that was really interesting. I didn't, I didn't know that, yeah. I think it was sherry because sherry is like thermostabilized and it passed their like quality food, food and beverage quality control standards. And I heard that it also got dumped after a parabolic flight where the person who had tried the sherry didn't keep the sherry down. Uh, and so it was thought that maybe it also wouldn't actually be so great in a zero G motion sickness environment but i don't know if i was going to be in space for a long time i'd i'd want some wine fair point yeah. i i have a question about the dandelion wine is that made with the flowers of the dandelion plant or the leaves or everything how it doesn't they don't have fruit so what do you put in how do you make dandelion wine it was the flowers so we went and we pulled like many many gallons worth of flowers and then you remove the green part and it's just it's just the flower part Okay. It was great because my son is like sort of obsessed with pulling the tops off of dandelions uh, or he was when we had them. And so we were just like, go nuts, buddy. And he just kind of, you know, we just had to make sure that he was putting them in a bag. But he was he was a, a great helper for that. That's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Well, I hope you made enough. So uh, next time I come visit, I can try it. We might have to make some more. I'm going through it pretty fast. <laughs> but, uh, but I'll keep that fair, in mind. Fair enough. Fair enough. That's cool. All right. Shall we get started with the first chat? Yeah, why don't we do that? So um, our, our first speaker today is Aaron Regberg. Um, and so we always ask our speakers to send us uh, just a little bit of information, not only about their talk, but about themselves. Um, so uh, Aaron Regberg is an astro-materials curator, and he's also the planetary protection lead for NASA's Johnson Space Center. Uh, so we both are um, coming to you from Houston today, and uh, we also ask for a uh, an interesting slash weird slash wonderful fact about our guests that uh, that they're willing to share. Uh, and so uh, Aaron's interesting fact is that he has a microbial growth experiment on his desk called, and I may mispronounce this, so Aaron, jump in if I get this wrong. Called a Winogradsky column. Winogradsky column, did I get yep. that right? Okay. Perfect, yep. And it's assembled by two of the astronauts who flew to space this week, is that right? Yeah, it's two of the, two of the, the newest astronauts that went up on crew three. That is so cool. 
So, um, and, and you, this was built as part of a geology class to teach the astronauts about microbial diversity. Yeah, so, the, so Winogradsky columns are, I could give a whole talk about Winogradsky columns, they're amazing. There are, you can go out and you can just gather sediment from your backyard or the creek or, or the, the ocean near your house, if you live near the ocean. Um, and you can basically add a little bit of nutrients and put it in the sunlight and you will get this redox stratification of different kinds of microbes growing uh, along an oxygen gradient inside the column. And it turns like part of, parts of it turn purple because you have these purple photosynthetic bacteria that will, that will take over in a certain section and other parts turn green. And it's like a really vivid, colorful way to, to see how um, microbes will segregate themselves based on like the, the, the chemistry of this, of this sediment column. And, and you can start with sediment from anywhere and you will get the same types of microbes no matter, no matter where your sediment came from because there's this, this sort of truism in, in microbiology that you know, all it takes is one, one microbe of the certain type. And if you, if you get the chemistry set up right, they'll take over and, and, and flourish. And you can also talk about how they alter, how those microbes alter the, the mineralogy of the sediments. Um, so we had the, the astronauts, when they were astronaut candidates, build these columns um, and they, they got one set and I kept one set on my desk. Um, and then when we had another class with them in a few months, I brought them back out and said, look at, look at how these things changed. You guys all like did something slightly different and they all ended up basically at the same spot, even though you guys all, all picked different sediments and different starting conditions. That's super cool. And, and, and definitely counts as both weird and wonderful as far as facts go about you. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> we, we already have someone suggesting an entire Winogradsky column talk in the future uh, in, in the Q and A box. So. I People fully, <laughs> fully support that suggestion. Absolutely. So um, yeah, so Aaron is going to be talking to us today about planetary protection at NASA. So take it away, Aaron. Okay. Yeah. I'll say if yeah, if you're interested in Winograsky columns, you can also you can Google it and you can figure out how to how to build them yourselves. It's it's super easy and they are really fun, like desk friends. <laughs> we all need desk friends. All right, so I share my screen and then I'm gonna put it into presentation mode. There you go, is that working? Okay, awesome. All right, so hello, I'm Aaron Regberg. I'm gonna talk about planetary protection at NASA. Uh, and so planetary protection, this is not something that I was super familiar with until I started working at NASA. But it's a practice of protecting solar system bodies from contamination by Earth life and also protecting the Earth from possible life forms that may be returned from other solar system bodies. Uh, and so this picture here, actually, let me make the little laser pointer show up. This picture is a picture of the Viking lander all packaged up in its, uh, in its capsule that it was going to travel to Mars in. And what these folks in the white suits are doing are rolling it into a giant oven, uh, essentially an autoclave. And they are going to bake out the entire spacecraft to try to kill all of the microbes that were on the spacecraft before we sent it to Mars. Uh, and so this was sort of the start of planetary protection for robotic missions was trying to sterilize an entire spacecraft. And we were, not 100% successful, but we did a very, very good job of reducing the number of microbes on this spacecraft. So planetary protection is kind of this, this like intersection of science and engineering and trying to um, protect other planets from contamination from Earth and, and then trying to avoid the, you know, the nightmare scenario that everybody writes science fiction books about, which is us bringing back some sort of scary microbe from another planet that destroys all life on Earth. Um, planetary protection is actually a law. Uh, so it, this, is, this, the, this idea of, of needing to protect um, the Earth and needing to protect other planets is actually written into the Outer Space Treaty, um, which was signed in, well, I think they started signing it in 1963 and entered into force of law in, in 1967. Um, and so there's, there's one sentence in Article 9 of this, this big, large treaty 
um, that the US is a signatory to. It says state parties to the treaty shall pursue studies of outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies and conduct exploration of them so as to avoid their harmful contamination and also adverse changes in the environment of the earth resulting from the introduction of extraterrestrial matter and where necessary shall adopt appropriate measures for this purpose. So all of planetary protection basically comes out of that one sentence. Um, and the actual sort of rules for how to do this are established by um, an international agency called COSPAR. Um, and you can see the COSPAR panel on planetary protection from the last time they were able to have an in-person meeting in 2019 uh, here on the right. And COSPAR is the Committee on Space Research. And so there's a group of engineers and scientists. This, uh, this woman in the front here is Lisa Pratt. That was the NASA planetary protection officer at the time. Uh, this is Jim Green, another NASA scientist. And then there are folks from representing the Japanese space agencies and European space agencies and the Russian space agency. Uh, China is also represented on this, on this panel. Um, they actually look at different, different bodies in the solar system and decide what the planetary protection classification should be for those bodies and then come up with rules for how we should protect the earth and how we should protect these other planets. Uh, I think this is the only, the only instance of, of scientific exploration that I know at NASA that is governed by an international treaty. Uh, at this high level. So this is something that NASA has been trying to do since 1967. Um, so you can sort of separate categories. There's backward planetary protection. This is protecting the Earth from extraterrestrial contamination. And so this is like, you know, for the Apollo missions, um, what we did was we quarantined the astronauts for the first few missions until we kind of realized that there probably wasn't any life on the moon and that wasn't necessary. Um, and then looking towards future missions, what we're going to be doing, so we're working on bringing back samples from Mars right now. This is sort of a, a rendering or a cartoon of how we're going to quarantine the Mars samples in orbit around Mars before we send them back to Earth. So the idea is that um, you know, the Perseverance rover is on the surface of Mars right now. It's going to drill all these samples and collect all these little core tubes. And then another rover is going to show up and pack all of those tubes into this little, this little drum or this little barrel here that's going to get launched into space. And we're going to call it the orbiting sample. And this orbiter is going to catch it and send it through this, this sort of assembly line where it's going to get packaged and contained and sealed up inside another container. So this will be a, a, a third layer of containment. And then that whole thing is gonna get transferred up into the capsule that's gonna get sent back to earth. Um, and the idea that they're talking about right now is actually brazing this outer container shut at like 500 degrees Celsius so that any dust or, or material that's on the outside of this orbiting sample, because remember this was on the surface of Mars, is contained and, and physically segregated from ever coming into contact with Earth. And so when the sample comes back to Earth and lands, we're gonna pick it up and we're gonna take it into a sample receiving facility that is gonna look a lot like a biosafety level four lab where people work with really scary pathogens like Ebola. And we're not gonna open it up until we get it into that sort of biological containment. And then scientists are gonna spend a lot of time looking at it uh, and making sure that there is nothing in that sample that poses a threat to anything on earth before we, before we let it out of containment. And that's exactly what we did with the Apollo samples as well. Um, they did things like feed uh, little bits of moon rocks to mice and things in, in the containment facility in Houston before we decided that those samples were safe for release to, to the wider scientific community. So that's backward planetary protection. Forward planetary protection is protecting other bodies on Earth from us, or sorry, other planets from us. So this is like baking out the Viking spacecraft, right? I already talked about this picture on the left. Um, and then this is actually, these are the Mars sample tubes um, that went to Mars on the Perseverance rover. And so these are two engineers at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California, and they're actually collecting samples um, to make sure that there are no viable microbes in or on those tubes before they're installed on the rover. And this is really, really important as well, 
because we don't want to be looking for life in samples and find terrestrial life that we sent to Mars and then brought back. That would be not great from a scientific perspective and we'd be wasting taxpayer dollars and all of this kind of stuff. Um, so that's why it's really important to protect outbound spacecraft as well. It also sort of plays into this larger idea of you know, thinking about how we how we go out and explore the solar system. And we, you know, a lot of people talk about establishing space colonies or colonizing space. And that has a has a pretty negative connotation in some circles. You know, there's a lot of damage that was done to terrestrial ecology during periods of colonization. And we really want to try to avoid that. We want to have as light a footprint as possible for as long as possible um, when we go out and explore these uh, these new places. So just real quick, this is a this is a super text heavy slide, but there's there's no way to sort of explain this without without just going through it. Um, COSPAR and NASA divide um, all of the solar system into five categories for planetary protection purposes. Um, and the requirements get stricter and stricter as the numbers get higher. So category one bodies are bodies that are not of direct interest for understanding the processes of chemical evolution and the origin of life. So those are things like undifferentiated metamorphosed asteroids, the moon Io, other places. Uh, one level higher of that is category two missions. Um, and so these are bodies of significant interest relative to the processes of chemical evolution and the origin of life, but where we're pretty sure that there isn't anything alive today. And so that's things like Venus, um, satellites of Jupiter, except for Io and Europa, Saturn, um, Uranus, Pluto. Category three bodies are bodies of significant interest to the process of chemical evolution and the origin of life, and where scientific opinion provides a significant chance that contamination could compromise future investigations. So those are places like Mars, Europa, Enceladus, if you're and and for Mars and Europa, it's it's category three if you're going to orbit it or if you're going to just fly by it. If you're actually going to land, it's a it's a category higher. It's category four. Um, uh, this for sample return missions. Um, so everything that's a sample return mission is category five. If it's unrestricted, uh, we're not particularly concerned about backward contamination. And so an example of an unrestricted uh, sample return mission is the Hayabusa 2 asteroid sample return mission that just landed last year and the OSIRIS-REx asteroid return sample mission that's coming back in uh, one year, in 2023. Restricted Earth return is where we are worried about backward contamination. And so that would be Mars sample return. Uh, interestingly, things in these categories are subject to change as we learn more about the body that we're going to. So the moon originally was a category five restricted earth return mission when we brought back samples for the first couple of Apollo missions. As we learned more about the moon and now we're pretty sure there's no life on the moon except for what we may have inadvertently brought there. Um, the moon has been downgraded to a cat, you know, bringing back samples is category five unrestricted. So they didn't have to quarantine the samples from the, the Chinese sample return mission that just, it just happened last year. Um, and going out to the moon is no longer category four, it's only category two, or in some cases it's even category one, depending on where you're going in the moon. Um, okay, so that's sort of how the framework of planetary protection works. Um, what I wanted to spend the, uh, oh, and one more slide that I forgot about here. How do I make this? Sorry, I can't read my own titles, which remind me what I want to say because of the, the share screen thing. Um, but basically, the way we meet these planetary protection requirements for robotic missions is by lots and lots of sampling and lots of lots of cleaning. Um, and so NASA has a, a standard microbial sampling assay they use for planetary protection. And it's based on the number of spore forming bacteria that we can grow on a very specific type of microbial growth medium called triptych soy agar. And so this is these spore forming bacteria are used as a proxy for any microbial cells that might be on the spacecraft. So if you can clean off or kill those bacteria, you've met the requirement and you're allowed to launch. As a scientist, there's a whole bunch of questions about how this actually works. Um, you know, the first of which is, well, what about all the microbes that we can't get to grow on this TSA agar? 
What about you know animals that don't like to eat that kind of food? Uh, and also, are we are we actually inadvertently selecting for microbes that can survive spaceflight? A lot of the cleaning is done with alcohol or very high very high temperatures or radiation, um, you know, desiccating environments, and these are all sort of the conditions that you expect to experience during spaceflight. And so we're actually evolving microbes in our clean rooms where we assemble these spacecraft that can survive spaceflight. These are kind of big, interesting scientific questions surrounding planetary protection. And they kind of annoy the engineers because they just want to launch their robots and do, do cool engineering things like fly helicopters around on Mars. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, but we have this sort of push and pull between the scientists and the engineers where the scientists want to make sure that we're, we're keeping things clean and, uh, enough that they can actually look for life on these other planets and make the measurements that they want to make. So, okay, I keep going here. Oops. So that's how it works for robotic missions. What I want to spend the rest of, the, of my time talking about is how's it going to work for a crewed mission? How do you clean a crewed mission? So this is, you know, on the left here, this is a picture of an astronaut on the surface of the moon during the Apollo missions. And what we knew a little bit of in the, in the 60s and the 70s, and what we know a whole lot more about now is that the human inside that spacesuit is pretty dirty. You know, there's all sorts of microbes living on our skin uh, and inside our bodies, and we can't get rid of them uh, on a human because it, it will actually make us sick if we if we destroy our own microbiome. So, and we can't you know we can't autoclave astronauts. No one's going to let us do that. No one wants to do that. So when we send people to Mars, which is something that NASA and lots of other space agencies want to do, how are we going to minimize the amount of contamination that we spread onto the surface? Do we need to filter everything that comes out of the spacesuits and everything that comes out of the habitats? Um, and then how close can an astronaut actually get to a sample without contaminating it? Should we still be using robots to collect and contain all of the really sensitive samples? Something that I learned when I started working at NASA is that spacesuits, the spacesuits that we currently use, the white spacesuits, the EMU that you see um, on TV, those work correctly. Um, when they're functioning correctly, they can leak as much as 100 cubic centimeters of gas a minute. Um, so that's you know a liter every 10 minutes. And that's totally fine. The engineers are OK with that. And there's no filters on any of those ports or vents or joints that are leaking. Uh, another thing that scientists worry about is what if our spacecraft are actually creating an artificial habitable zone? So there's going to be a warm, wet, damp spot underneath these leaky spacecraft that we send to Mars. And what if that makes a place for, for Earth bacteria to grow? Um, so one of the projects that I'm involved with at NASA is actually a, a tool that we're going to send up to the International Space Station to try to answer these questions. So this is basically a, a microbial sampling kit that you can take out during a spacewalk. So these are very over-engineered Q-tips, essentially. But we have eight of these canisters. There's six on the top here in this caddy and two on the bottom. Um, and inside these canisters is this, this big buccal swab. It's a foam swab. It's much bigger than, than a, than a Q-tip. It's about the size of a, a quarter. Um, and then at the base of those canisters is a filter, um, a 0.22 micron Teflon filter that allows these things to equalize uh, pressure when they go in and out of vacuum without letting any microbes in or out, except for what we've collected on this swab. Uh, so we tested this on Earth. We had the astronauts get into their spacesuits and we put a uh, differential pressure on them that is the same as what they would experience during an EVA. And we had them try to sample parts of their own suits. Um, and when that worked out well, we actually put uh, engineers, test engineers into a vacuum chamber and pulled it down to vacuum. Uh, and while they were testing some other things uh, for the Orion capsule, we had them try to swab their suits at vacuum. Uh, and that was also successful. And the thing that was really interesting about these experiments is that we found a whole bunch of microbes that were still viable. We were still able to grow them after hanging out at vacuum for over six hours in these vacuum chamber tests. So this is a graph of colony forming units, which is the number of bacteria that we were able to grow. And these are a bunch of different bacteria that we found on those spacesuits. 
And so the orange colors are bacteria and fungi that we found on the spacesuits, and then blue and gray colors are bacteria that we found in the chamber, either before or after we did that test. And so the interesting thing about this is a lot of the stuff that we found that survived vacuum is not spore forming bacteria. It's not these super hardy extremophilic microorganisms that we expect to survive space tra travel. You know, the most abundant thing that we found that survived vacuum is, is Staphylococcus capitis, which is just a normal skin bacteria. It, it, as far as we know, doesn't do anything special to help it survive vacuum. Um, and the, the spore forming bacteria, things like this Bacillus cereus here, um, or this Bacillus megatarium, we actually didn't find on the spacesuits, which was kind of interesting. So it sort of defied our expectations a little bit. We also did um, DNA sequencing on these, on these samples. So we, we followed sort of the NASA standard assay here. We collected these samples. We tried to grow them on that triptych soy agar. We used a bunch of other different kinds of things too, because we, we didn't want to limit the kind of food that we were feeding them. And we found about 24 different microorganisms in this test. We then did DNA sequencing. Um, and so this is the relative abundance of different bacterial species. Um, and so each little colored bar in this chart is a different microorganism. And so we've got pre-test samples, we've got the suit samples, post-set samples, and then we've got our sequencing blanks over here on the right. And the point of this, there's two points. So you see way more than 24 different colors on this plot. There's actually about um, 2,400 different little bars on this. So we found a hundred times more organisms through DNA sequencing than we were able to find through culturing. And the other thing is if you're saying, Aaron, I can't tell the difference between the pre-test samples, the post-test samples and the suit samples, you're absolutely right. Um, the suits are microbiologically indistinguishable from the environment where we collected the samples. So what was ever was in the vacuum chamber was on the suits and what was ever was on the suits was in the vacuum chamber. And this is a pretty accurate set up for how we currently think we're going to use suits on Mars. You know, we'll have them in an airlock. Um, the astronauts will go into the airlock and get into the suits. Uh, and so whatever sort of microbes are on or about the astronauts are probably going to get on the outside of the suits unless we radically change our, our design for going to Mars. So this is kind of where we are with this project right now. And where we're going next is the International Space Station. We're working through the safety permissions to fly that uh, caddy up to the International Space Station. And we're gonna have the astronauts take it out with them on spacewalks, extravehicular activities. And we're gonna have them collect samples of the handrails and the hatches and these things called non-propulsive vents, um, which are areas where we take atmosphere from inside space station and just sort of shoot it out into space to keep the atmosphere inside station livable. Uh, and we're going to see what kind of microbes we can find out there. And then um, we're going to bring those samples back into ISS, and we're going to freeze them, and we're going to bring them back down onto Earth for DNA sequencing. Uh, and then the results of this are going to teach us, hopefully, about how to improve our systems for when we go to Mars and how to minimize the contamination when we, when we actually do send astronauts to Mars. So I think that's, that's enough for me. I want to make sure uh, Oscar has lots of time to talk, too. So thanks a lot, and I'm happy to take any questions that folks might have. Thank you, Aaron. That was really, really interesting. Um, wow. Um, I know I have lots of questions. We're starting to get some questions coming into the to the Q and A. So I'll encourage all the other uh, participants to to uh, write their questions here. Um, I'll start off with one uh, from Hannah, who wants to know, is the relevant abundance of bacteria post-vacuum related more to their ability to survive vacuum or the effects of an EVA on the human body that could cause these bacteria to shed off the body more? That is a really interesting question. I don't know. We, I, have, I, I, hadn't, I hadn't even considered that. I don't know if people shed more bacteria off of their skin during an EVA. There's, there, 
it's like exercising, you know, when for a real EVA that it, it's like, it's like seven hours that they're out there and they're, and the astronauts are sweating and they're working really hard and they're doing all of these tasks. I have, I have no idea. That's a super interesting question, Hannah. Thanks. Honestly, all right. We're, yeah, we're bringing, bringing uh, unanswered questions. That's always a good thing. We can prompt, uh, prompt some new, new research here. So I, I have some questions that I've been dying to ask you since I saw your name on the list of people who wanted to present. So, okay, so my first question is, so I've been reading a little bit about space law, so I'm a little familiar with the space law stuff you talked about. So when the tardigrades, tardig tardigrades landed on the moon, my first thought was, isn't that a violation of international law? And so what do you, can you give everyone some background on what I'm talking about and what you think about that whole thing actually happening? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So there was an Israeli mission to the moon. Uh, I think it was called Space IL, or I can't. Or the lander was called Bereshit, um, and they that was supposed to land on the moon, uh, and it crashed into the moon, and it it had a it had a NASA payload on it. Um, it had a I think it was a retro reflector that we were going to aim lasers at and make measurements of how far away the moon was. It, it's uh, and uh, one of the scientists involved in that mission put live tardigrades, the little water bears, um, on the mission and didn't, not only did they not tell anybody about it, I think they were directly asked, are there any living organisms on this thing? And they lied and they said no. And then it crashed into the moon uh, and Tardigrades are, are very, very hardy microorganisms. They can survive exposure to vacuum. They put them outside the International Space Station and left them out there for, I forget, I think it was like months and months and months. And then they brought them back inside and woke them up and they just like crawled around like nothing had happened. They're, they're fascinating organisms. Um, so it's likely that there are or, or were living tardigrades on the surface of the moon. Um, and it was, pretty embarrassing for NASA um, because, because NASA was involved, we were the agency that was supposed to check and make sure that um, planetary protection rules were being followed. However, and this is a really important point that I think people don't realize, NASA is not a regulatory agency. We have no ability to enforce rules or laws for non NASA missions. We can make rules for stuff that we're in charge of and we do all the time or stuff that we're paying for. Um, but if a private company wants to launch a mission to Mars or a mission to the moon, NASA can provide guidance, but we have no enforcement authority. Um, so yeah, they broke, the, they broke the rule, they broke the law. Um, it's not NASA's job to penalize those people for that. Uh, and it's kind of an open question in the federal government, like whose job it is. Um, it might be the FAA's job. It might be some other agency's job. It's something that people way, way high above me are trying to figure out right now. Um, and it's going to become more and more relevant because there are only going to be more commercial missions with no NASA funding going to going to these planets. So we, the, the United States is, is responsible for enforcing the provisions of that treaty for commercial, commercial ventures. Um, but we, the federal government hasn't quite figured out how they're gonna do that yet. Uh, does that answer your question, Kelly? It, it does, and it's interesting because I, I thought it was clearly the FAA's responsibility, but, and I hadn't realized that it's not actually clear whose responsibility it is. Uh, and, and Scott, I'm going to step on your toes a little bit and, and do, can I do Hannah's follow-up question about the punishment for breaking international law? Because I was kind of wondering, yeah. like, what, what happens now? Like, if that is a violation of the OST, so my sense is that the OST doesn't really have any teeth. Does this kind of prove that that is the case? I, I, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start by saying I'm not a lawyer. Okay. Fair <laughs> enough, fair enough. Same here. Um, but yeah, it does kind of seem like there isn't, it doesn't have any teeth. It does. It does kind of seem like that right now, and I think that's a, a problem with my scientist hat on. Um, I'm I'm concerned that we could end up 
ruining ruining things for science, you know, ruining our ability to search for life in other places if we move if we move too fast with some of this stuff. I I, I think the, the the US government is trying to figure that out. There's a there's an effort going on to try to figure out who who should have that authority and who should be able to penalize people. Uh, and I think you're right. Some of the some of that authority is going to devolve to the to the FAA, um, but it's not it's not totally clear yet. And and everybody is my experience has been everybody is really nervous about saying they're in charge of something without there being a law passed that says they're in charge of something because they don't want to get in trouble for for overreaching their authority. Sure, and nobody wants to be committing to more work in the future and to being the responsible party. Yeah, that that too. And it's and it's tough for the FAA because they don't really have the scientists, right? Like they 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 did review that. I think they well, I forget where that was. That was that mission launched from from the U.S. It wasn't, was it? I don't remember. I don't remember I think either. It was because the FAA reviewed it. I was gonna say, okay, so it was, yeah, so the FAA did review it, um, but the, they're engineers, they're not scientists, and they're not, you know, it's not necessarily clear that even if they had seen the tardigrades in their little test tube or whatever they were packaged up in, stuck inside the spacecraft, that they would have known what they were looking at. So if, if you are gonna make this the FAA's job, the FAA is gonna have to go out and hire a bunch of scientists, basically, and train them to how to, how to inspect and how to look for this stuff. Well, and, and if people lie, like, are, is the FAA required to go and follow up on everything that gets put on a sheet? Like, if people are lying, I don't think, yeah, I guess it would just be their, their responsibility in that case to punish them for it. But anyway. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really hard, it's a really hard question. Yes. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> So, okay, so I have a question about thinking about this issue of, of bat contamination, of, of potentially, you know, contaminating Earth with whatever is living outside of Earth. So I mean, you talked a little bit about this in your talk, but what assumptions generally go into those calculations about what that life looks like? Are we assuming that life beyond Earth is like Earth life or how kind of open-minded are, are people about what form or what characteristics that life might, might have? We're trying to be really open-minded when we do the risk assessment for that. And I'll, I'll talk about the Mars sample return because that's the one that's, that's nearest term and people are actually planning, planning for it now. Um, and there's a group of scientists that are, and this should get published, soon, I hope, that are working on a, what's called a sample safety assessment protocol for basically how to determine, is there life in these samples that we brought back? Um, and is it dangerous to Earth? And so they sort of step through and they start by looking for life that looks like life that we find on Earth. Um, and then at the end, they have a couple of experiments that they've proposed that we hope can identify life that is totally different than life on Earth, not even DNA based. Um, but it's really hard because all of the life that we know about is life on Earth. So we're, we're incredibly biased and we only know what we know. Um, so it's, it's, very, it's very challenging to try to think about how you would assess life that was just totally different than, than what we find on Earth. Um, one of the things that's been proposed is some of these new DNA sequencers that are that are available now, um, people think they're capable of sequencing polymers that are not DNA, and so there's this idea that even if we, even if life is not DNA based, it's going to have to have some repeating unit inside of it that carries genetic information, and that's a big assumption too. But again, we only know what we know, and so the the idea is that we we could take these sequencers and have them sort of be agnostic, they call them agnostic life detection measurements, where you just try to measure any sort of repeating molecule in a sample. And if you find enough of them and they're complex enough, you say, oh, maybe this is, maybe this is life and we better, we better look at this a little bit harder. So it's just looking for some kind of a code, basically, something that could be 
potentially functioning as a code. That's that's kind of the idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. Very cool. So uh, you mentioned that sometimes the techniques for trying to avoid contamination annoy the engineers. And that immediately made me think of an engineer who to me appears to always be annoyed. And that's Robert Zubrin. And Robert Zubrin was talking about how uh, he thinks that planetary protection and worrying about backwards protection, so worrying about like Mars contaminating Earth is really silly. And he wasn't quite that nice about it uh, because any, because we have had things from Mars land on earth and his argument was that you know there's like parts of like the middle of like a meteorite or whatever it's called when it lands on earth that has not been exposed to the vacuum of space that probably would have microbes if they existed on mars so martian microbes have probably already had a chance to make it to earth so to go through all of this stuff to try to keep backwards contamination from happening when it's probably happening naturally all the time is ridiculous what do you think about that argument? I, I, I don't, I don't want to be the one to get that wrong is what I think about that argument. You yeah. know, I mean, there are lots of examples on earth of havoc re wreaked on, on isolated ecosystems when we, when we brought in new organisms, you know, you can look at Australia, you can look at Hawaii. Um, this, this specific critique of, you know, the, the Martian meteorites, is interesting. Yes, there has been a lot of, of material from Mars that has made it to Earth. And yes, in the interior of those rocks has probably been protected from the, the hot temperatures on, on re-entry. It, it certainly got very, very cold and was exposed to radiation in the hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands or millions of years that those rocks were in orbit before they got to Earth. Um, but also you have to think about how those rocks got off the surface of Mars. They got ejected into orbit when something else hit Mars. Uh, and if we look at the mineralogy of those meteorites, they're, they're, they're shocked. They've been subjected, even in the interiors, to very high temperatures and very high pressures because something smacked into Mars and knocked, you know, hit Mars hard enough that they were knocked into orbit. Um, so that could have been a sterilizing event. We're not going to get the... Um, Samples that we want to bring back, we're going to get into orbit in a much gentler fashion. Um, we're not going to. The requirement for those samples is that they never experience a temperature higher than 60 degrees Celsius once they're inside the tubes. So they're not going to, they're not going to have that really violent ejection into orbit that those Martian meteorites had. So I, I think you know, he may be overlooking or misunderstanding that part of the equation. Um, and I, I also just, my personal belief is th this is not something we want to get wrong. The, the, it, it's, it is a, the probability that, that there is life on Mars and that, that, that life is toxic to, to Earth life is very, very low. But the consequences are very, very, very high if we get it wrong. Agreed. Aaron, do you think this is a showstopper for Mars mission? Like, we have everything ready. We have the rocket, we have the habitats, we have everything. And then some planetary protection officer says, no, this is not like a, the right thing to do. Do you think that this would deter people from going to Mars? This could be like a showstopper for Mars missions? I don't, I don't think it'll be a showstopper. I do hope I do hope that we think about it really hard before before we go. I hope we are are more careful about preserving the Martian environment than we have been in the past about preserving environments when we go and explore new parts of Earth. Um, and I, I, the the planetary protect the, the so there is a planetary protection officer at NASA headquarters, and it's their job to sort of be the decider on all of this stuff. And it's a really hard job. Every, my impression is everyone is mad at them all the time because um, they are trying to balance this desire to explore and to go out and to do cool things with, with the scientists' desire to, to be able to do science and to be able to understand the, the places that we're exploring. And they don't want to be, 
they don't want to be the person that just says no you can't go so they try to they're we're trying to find a, a way to be able to send people and and minimize or mitigate the amount of contamination that we introduce if we were to discover that there is in fact life on mars uh in the you know next few years or so do you think that would change the calculations what would would that you know make those uh, justifications much more difficult? Yeah, you know, I mean, I don't know. I would, I would, I would hope so. Um, right? Like, I would hope we would, we would, if we, if we found life on another planet, I hope we would have enough respect for that life that we wouldn't just like outcompete it to extinction. Um, yeah. We would figure out a way to 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 go and to to preserve that life without without totally making it so we couldn't explore other planets. Yeah, I mean it'd be tough, right? Because at the one on the one hand, it would of course make the concerns much more, you know, more serious, more more pressing. But at the same time, it would make the, you know, it would it would just be so much more interesting to go and to send people right who can who can be on the ground and do the sampling and and study it and understand it and, and certainly drive public interest so boy, yeah your, your job will get a lot more complicated if that happens it it's gonna get really interesting when we bring those martian samples back no matter yeah. what yeah That's right. i mean think if you I, if you think about the if you're old enough to remember you know when, when bill clinton declared that we had found life on mars and the martian meteorites um and the the scientific sort of frenzy that surrounded those samples, it's going to be that all over again and worse when when we bring these these samples back from Mars. And remind us, what's the time frame like for that? Ten about ten years. Um, so the I think the 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 desire is to have those samples back on Earth by twenty thirty three or thirty four. So Perseverance is out there now collecting samples, making observations, and there will be separate probes that will go to, to retrieve those and bring them back, right? Yes. Yeah. So the current, the current plan that's being, being sort of worked out between NASA and uh, the European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency and JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency, is to launch two more missions. One would be that orbiter that I should, sort of showed you the cartoon of. Uh, and the second one would be another lander with a small rover to go pick up all the tubes and a rocket called the Mars Ascent Vehicle to, to, to shoot them back into space, which is something we have never, ever, ever, no one has ever done before. We've never launched something off the surface of another planet. So just, just getting that far will be super, super cool. Yeah, absolutely. It's like goosebumps just thinking about it. That's pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think we should move on to Oscar's chat, uh, but this was awesome. Thank you so much, Aaron. And you yeah, should come back during Oscar's Q&A so we can keep all of the questions going. Uh, and so I have the pleasure of introducing Oscar. So Oscar and I met in 2019 at the International Astronautical Congress. Uh, and uh, his, he's gonna be talking about life on analog Mars. Uh, his full name is Oscar Ojeda, and he is currently a master's student in the School of Aeronautics and Astronautics at Purdue University. And his fun fact is that he used to own a restaurant and own and run a restaurant a long time ago, and he's working on getting his private pilot's license. And so like, you know, I've always thought a, Oscar is going to tell us about some like analog work that he's done. And I've always thought, you know, if I was like to go to Mars, it would be fun to have Oscar there because he's like a nice guy. He's interesting. And now that I know that you also cook and you're working on being a pilot, you know, I definitely hope that you're on my crew if I ever get to, you know, go to Mars or do an analog or something. So take it away. Thank you. Of course, I'd be glad to have you in my crew. Actually, <laughs> yeah. So uh, hello, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. Um, it is a real pleasure to be here. It is, it is a nice uh, environment. It's great to chat with everyone. So, uh, and talk a little bit about what, what I do. So I'm gonna talk about my experience with analog research, which I will explain in a minute what it is. 
So we were talking about Mars, right? We were talking about uh, all these ideas of going to Mars and most of these conversations center around the architecture. Like Aaron was talking about, like the lander uh, goes and pick up the things and then it goes up and the ascent vehicle. Well, there's a lot of, um, you know, talks, a lot of conversations about these same ideas for human missions. So we're going to have uh, the vehicle that takes people from the earth uh, to Mars, the habitats, the crew, the transports, the ascent vehicles and all these, all these elements of this architecture. And Testing those is very important. However, in this conversation, there is an aspect that sometimes is overlooked and is the fact that humans are treated like a black box. So uh, in engineering, the black box uh, concept is something that is there with some requirements, with some inputs and some outputs, but you don't really care about what's happening on the inside. And in this case, it is very, very important to know what is happening on the inside because the human system is, uh, is not very predictable, is not necessarily is straightforward in a lot of aspects. So what we're trying to do uh, through analog research, uh, to, through some aspect of analog research, of course, is to be able to test how it is for humans to be in these missions, which uh, will require uh, confinement, isolation, and a lot of uh, like pressure in a lot of aspects to humans. So we have when when we I do these kind of presentations uh, in a, in a uh, several settings. I play this game, which is Mars or Earth. Um, so basically, this is to show that we have on Earth several locations that actually resemble a lot, not only Mars, but other locations on, on, on space. So based on this concept, based on the concept of like systems engineering and a model on systems engineering, we get to uh, analog research. So what we do with analog research is a, that we find locations or situations on earth that somehow resemble in one or more aspects, a location or situation in space. In, it can be a planetary surface, it can be microgravity, it can be different uh, aspects. So this concept has uh, been like getting traction and popularity recently, but it is not a new thing necessarily. This has been done since uh, like the space race, the Apollo era, when there were a lot of questions that were unanswered. Uh, and in this case, for example, the humans, like the missions were really short, like uh, weeks compared to what we have and compared to what we need for like the Artemis um, missions in terms of the architecture of duration and also for Mars missions in terms of how long would it take uh, just to get there and to be there and then come back. So uh, also the idea of who gets to go to space has changed a lot uh, originally we had like this uh, idea of, uh, of the astronaut as like a, the, daredevil, the daredevil that, uh, you know, uh, rode uh, Corvettes and Mustangs and, you know, was like a fighter pilot. But then we evolve into more, we need other traits uh, and that are not necessarily that, uh, that idea of what was the right stuff uh, that time. So what is the idea of, of analog research? You get to test to a lower cost and risk, some aspects of exploration that would otherwise go like be very costly and very, very risky. Uh, of course, you have some tests that are technical, so you can test a, a wheel. So you go to a desert with a basalt field or you know, uh, some field that recreates the, the environment and you test the wheel. That is quite straightforward. You can do it in a lab as well. And that recreates very well what is going to happen to your technical elements on um, on your location in space. But then uh, there are other aspects that are harder to simulate. So the other aspect is to simulate environments and to simulate how things are going to happen. And uh, finally, find emerging behavior. So this is things that you were not expecting, things that uh, you were not uh, thinking about when you were designing your system that came up and then uh, 
it can be a positive thing sometimes, but also it can be a negative thing. It's, and you can find problems that you didn't even know existed, right? How we interact with certain interface or like how people interact between themselves for long periods of time. So there is honestly a, a lot of skepticism uh, from the technical side of space exploration towards some of these uh, aspects of, of analog research because uh, there's a thin line between like actually being doing research and doing a, you know, spacesuit cosplay. So this is a, a very important aspect that we have to take into account. So these next two graphs are some uh, basic graphs I developed in my, in my research. So this is um, like a very simplified schematic of uh, the Earth Mars system in terms of communications uh, mainly. Uh, so you have some things happening here, right? Uh, you have an on-site, like a crude mission architecture uh, within Mars. You have other things that are happening on Mars. And then you have other things happening on Earth. So this is a, as, as I mentioned, this is a very basic system in terms of communication. Um, but the thing is that you have to be able to represent what is happening there on the Earth to be able to provide a very good simulation and, and a simulation that will actually tell you and without actually provide information on what's happening uh, in, this, in this mission. So this is a representation of uh, analog systems. Uh, so you have natural analog environments like uh, some of the pictures I showed you earlier, which because of their uh, geological features or it's the composition of the soil, or the radiation, or for any interest in a natural feature are a analogs, or you can create artificial environments that are also analogs. And you can, obviously there's an overlap here when you create, for example, a habitat and you put it in the middle of the desert, there you have a combination of both an artificial and, an, and a natural environment, a analog environment. But for example, you can also have these type of, of, uh, of situations in locations such as, uh, uh, now that you mentioned the Johnson Space Center where, where Aaron is based, we have the HERA, which is an analog that is uh, located within an, a hangar that you, currently there's a crew running there or the Sirius crew in, in Russia uh, where there's a, an eight month mission currently just started like two weeks ago. Uh, you have other laboratories when you can recreate high radiation or vacuum environments. And then you have, for example, bed rest studies, which are uh, studies where people to simulate the effects of microgravity, just lay in bed for months at a time and see how uh, like this fluid shift affects their, their bodies. So there is a frontier that is very, very valuable for this analog research that is the insimulation frontier. I mean. The thing is, whatever is inside of this uh, frontier is a simulation of what would be to be in this system, like to be here. You're gonna have say, similar restrictions. You're gonna have similar uh, uh, operational uh, restrictions. So you're gonna have EVA, science, robotics, and uh, other types of technical tests that are gonna take place within the simulation. And that's where you get the value of it. Uh, for example, here, the bed rest studies are overlapping because uh, there are some aspects of it that are not required for it to work. For example, you're, gonna, you're not going to restrain these uh, best uh, bed rest studies uh, subjects to communication limitations or not to interact with other people. But still, there is a, a part of it that is a, a simulation. So moving on. Um, this is, these are, are some examples of analog stations. Um, so I'm gonna talk a, a little bit about this one later. This is a, a new station that we're, we're designing and building. This was the Amadi 18 um, mission that was performed by the Austrian Space Forum, which is very, very, uh, an organization which is very, very strong on, on analog missions. This is uh, the Utah desert. This is the Mars Desert Research Station run by the Mars Society. Uh, this is located in like a desert, like 45 minutes from the nearest town, which is like a very, very small town in the middle of nowhere, Hanksville, Utah. This one on the right is the high seas station located in Mauna Loa. 
uh, in Hawaii, in the Big Island in Hawaii. And this is a, a small station we have in Colombia, uh, which is uh, basically a greenhouse for analog crop uh, research. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, there has not been a lot of activity going on there, but uh, it is, a, it is a, a facility that, that exists. So I have been able to be in three analog missions, uh, two of them uh, here at the MDRS. And uh, it's, it's a very, very interesting location in terms of like uh, how the environment just by itself is a very immersive environment. Uh, just because of like of the color of the desert, like the remoteness of, of it and how you run some of the operations. And the third one was earlier this year in Hawaii uh, where I participated in the Celine 3 uh, mission. And um, this, uh, like earlier this, this, uh, this past month, I was able to present some of the results that we got from, from this mission in the International Astronautical Congress. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, my, my experience, so uh, bonding with the crews, you do science uh, activities, you do crop growth, uh, simulation activities, not, not simulation in terms of that, like you do not grow crops, but that you're simulating how to grow, grow them in a, like in this type of environment. Um, this is my crew. Uh, this was the first 100% Colombian crew um, that we was particip what that participated at the MDRS. Uh, so you have different types of crew time. You have, for example, a lot of time is required for maintenance and like keeping the station functional, uh, just because this is like a, a system that re requires attention in, in different aspects. So uh, automation is gonna be key for developing these future missions. You also do research. Each one of us had a research project um, at this point, like most participants of, of these uh, missions are uh, engaged in some type of uh, like studies and have their own research and have their own interest to be there. There's also participants that are not only STEM fields, but also humanities, arts, which are key and are very important for these type of things. So research time is not as long as you may think and um, you don't have as, as much resources as you would like to. So it is very challenging to perform like this specific type of research on, on a remote location like this. And uh, conditions are very frail. For example, uh, one batch of microbial growth um, experiments went bad just because the, uh, the power went down and that, was, that is something that you have to deal with. So it was complicated. You also have personal time where you have you have to sleep, you have to take care of yourself. Um, during these experiences, there is no, there's a lot of limitations in terms of, I mentioned them, I, I mentioned that there are, but I have not specified them. So you, all the food you have is dehydrated. So uh, like everything is dehydrated food, like grains, you have to rehydrate them to, to eat them or cook them. Um, the first experience we had, uh, with uh, dehydrated eggs was not the best, but then we learned how to pr properly cook them and they were amazing. Um, and that the food, I, I'm, I have some pictures of food that I'm gonna show you as well. But um, so we also have limited water. So that means that a lot of appliances are waterless, for example, toilets and, and, and these, kinds of, these kind of things. And also uh, showers are not allowed. So you have to clean yourself with like a baby wipes for like the, the duration of, of these missions. Each of these ones, uh, rotations were two weeks. So yeah. And then you have crew time where you spend time bonding with, with your crew members and talking and cooking and eating. And it is very important to keep like a very good relationship and, and to keep things going well at the station. Uh, there are some experiences that are similar to analog research, but that are operational, like for example, uh, Arctic stations or Antarctic stations and um, submar submarines, like nuclear submarine crews. And also you have a, like offshore a drilling a stations that are like, you have people working in a stressful environment with a lot of pressure. 
So there's a story that I remember I talked to with, with, with Kelly uh, this uh, some time ago. It was about one uh, Russian crew member that stabbed another one in a station in the Antarctica. So the thing is that they were saying uh, it, it was not like 100% confirmed, but there was a rumor that the reason why one of the Russian crew members stopped the other one was because he was spoiling uh, books for him. Like he was reading something and then he walked by and said the ending of the book. So, you know, small things can, can be harsh in this kind of environment. So uh, spending time with your crew members is, is uh, very important. This is from uh, high seas. Uh, this was my crew, uh, high seas, which was, which was a very interesting crew. It was a very diverse crew in terms of origins, in terms of backgrounds, in terms of uh, a lot of aspects. Uh, so this, this is key. This is the food. Uh, so you see, this is uh, apples. Um, this is meat, which is not like the most, uh, you know, best looking meat that you, you will have. It's not a, a, a New York strip, definitely. Um, we have, these are the eggs. Uh, these are not like the best eggs. This is cheese, by the way. So you see, being creative with food is very important. And uh, eating and eating together, it's uh, a very, very important aspect of like keeping the spirits up because you can get frustrated very fast. You can get depressed very fast. And uh, there are a lot of stories about that. We, I don't think we have the time to talk about some of, some of them, but, uh, but definitely keeping the spirits up during this kind of environment, uh, during this kind of experience and in this environment is very important. And uh, for example, one a magnificent experience is a going into the greenhouse and like smelling the plants and being in touch with with this greenery and with these things, it is it is key. Like it, it gives you a, a lot of a lot of energy. Um, and then you have the EVAs, which like these these are some space with simulators. This is one we developed in 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 Colombia. Uh, and so these are not necessarily functional spacesuits in terms of they're going to be a pressure suit uh, with other things, but they help you uh, put limitations on how you do certain activities while you are on the surface of, of a planet and some things that are challenging. This was our, our mascot. And, uh, and if I, if, if not, when, <laughs> when I get to go to space, this is going to be my, my zero G indicator <laughs> for sure. Keep my fingers crossed. But um, so while you do these EVAs, uh, you, you have some challenges. Like for example, you can see the, the here the fogging, that's for, of course something that has to be fixed. Uh, but the, 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 your field of view is reduced. You have, you're carrying something heavy on your back. So uh, you, you're wearing gloves, which are not the most uh, practical thing to do things. So Astronauts right now do have these limitations, so they're gonna have it even in, like even they're still gonna have them in the surface of the planet. So we we need to uh, work on that. And it is amazing. It is beautiful to be able to be in these places. This is just I wanted to show you these these locations because they are definitely uh, gorgeous. This is Utah. Uh, this is Hawaii, and this immersion is definitely. Like you feel like you're not on Earth, and uh, part of it is like the narrative you get into. Like, of course, you know you're on Earth, but when you're really into it, you it, it can be very, very immersive, and it can be very, very uh, real. And still, you're in a remote location, so it is risky. So even even uh, even if it's not space. Uh, there are some risks you cannot take because it's simply like help is hours away and uh, and you can you know injure yourself if you're not careful. So uh, one of the things we're doing this is a, a project that was uh, uh, sponsored by the uh, incubator space project incubator from the Space Generation Advisory Council. We are developing this open source habitat. Uh, for uh, doing analog missions in, in non-spacefaring nations. Because 
a lot of the of the locations I mentioned are rather restricted because of your nationality or because of the price or because of a lot of things. So uh, there are locations in the Arctic, there are locations in, in Europe, in Russia, in uh, Houston, in, in Utah, but some of them are, are very restrictive. So we uh, are working to develop this, this station. We're gonna start building it hopefully uh, this December uh, where the, the habitat is called Hadis C. Uh, it's uh, like the Spanish acronym for Analog Habitat for Simulated Space Exploration. Uh, it's gonna feature five independent structures, crew quarters, greenhouse, airlock kitchen, the main dome with laboratories, uh, with this total area. And the thing is this, this uh, to build this entire habitat uh, and to run it, is, it costs less than $10,000, which is uh, fairly cheap for, for this. So we want to open this up for, for more people to be able to participate in analog research. Because if we have more people doing this, then we're going to be able to uh, have more questions answered and more questions arising at the same time. Uh, and some of those questions are like, uh, how do we increase the fidelity? How do we tackle the demography problem in terms of uh, the astronauts that are going to go to space and to explore uh, the moon and Mars are not necessarily the undergrads that are taking part of this analog mission. So how do we tackle that? How do we increase immersion? How do we take the findings that we have, uh, that we get here for actual missions? And how do we open it up for more participants? How, how the space tourism industry is gonna change this? Uh, how are we gonna grow crops? How are we gonna do technical elements? How, what type of tools are gonna be needed? How do we work on automation? So there's a huge list of things that are gonna be required. So that's what we want to be able to uh, keep opening uh, this, this up. And we're looking for researchers, for crews and for people to support this. And of course we want people to keep participating in, in, in the currently established analytics. There are, like Pisces right now is running month lock missions um, sponsored by federal agencies on, towards this type of, of like serious research. HERA is running one, Sirius is running one. So there are a lot of things happening. Uh, and, uh, and and we, we I understand where some of the skepticism comes from. And uh, so we have to work in making it, making it uh, better and uh, trying to, create a benchmark for like understanding better this, this research and to, to be able to work on this. So I'm not gonna, let's get into the conversation. <laughs> Thank you so Viva much. Oscar. That, that was awesome. Are you still trying to learn Russian? Yes, uh, a little bit. <laughs> awesome, yeah, me, me too, a little bit. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so I love hearing you talk about analogs and I love getting to chat with you about analogs. So this was awesome, thank you. So my, my first question then is, can you give us some examples of like, so you know, we're, we're thinking of going, we're thinking of settling space and there's still some things we need to know before we do that, or there's things we should know before we do that. What are some of those questions that we don't know the answers to yet that are best answered by analogs and simulations that, that we should that we should be working on uh, investing in the most right now? I would say um, automation, like workload, for example, how much workload does a crew, can a crew uh, perform? You know, how much workload can you put on a crew before it gets uh, crazy? You know, for example, an ex uh, the, the EF35 um, head up display, for the helmets. At some point, I think there was a problem because it was so overwhelming because it was just bombarding the pilot with, with uh, information. So like, imagine this uh, for a crew, how much can you put on a crew and what needs to be uh, you know, automated? There is also, for example, the problem of, of integrating crop growth into the diet of astronauts. It's gonna be a, a very, very uh, demanding job not only to grow it but also to process it and then to cook it and for example we we did some research uh, some time ago about like a, a pharmaceutical kit for a uh, deep space missions and the, the question we we started with was what kind of injuries are going to be ex these astronauts exposed to 
So what, what is going to happen to them? And then we found a, in a database for these analogs like a exhaustion, a small cuts, a inflammation. A, so we, we try to develop how a, with like how can you do that with plants because you don't know how for how long this medicine is going to be stable in a store in a locker, right? So uh, how can we do that? So for example, that, that as well, how do you keep this crew motivated? You know, I mean, survival is, tends to be a good motivator, but you don't want people just to survive. You want people to thrive. Um, how do you make sure that you're going to, you're doing good science and that you have the, the resources to do good science on, on Mars? What is the best architecture? Like, do you need like a, like it, 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 will it be like a dorm room, like for a college dorm room, or do you want each one to have like their own like proper room with a desk, with lamps and how they will they interact? And there's actually a very, very interesting um, experiment going on that this is, I, I encourage you to look for it. So uh, this is something that is gonna be happening in the space station. So this is a, a like, um, an anthropological and kind of archaeological uh, evaluation of the space station on, on on looking at the human aspect of it. So I mean, the list could, could go go on no, 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 no. But but yeah. So so those are some of the things that just come come to mind. I'm wondering about the crew composition. Like you mentioned in your some of your experiences that like one of them, it was a, a, a all Colombian crew. And then you mentioned that the high seas crew was a more diverse crew. So in your experience, how does that affect the dynamics? Like, you know, what, what are, what, how did you see that sort of, did you see that affecting any of the, what the dynamics were like among, you know, the, the various crew members and how you guys were able to, to do your work? I would say that the, the, the more diverse the more perspectives you have. And I think that going into another planet, it's gonna be a, a problem solving experience. It's gonna be like a 500 day escape room. So the thing is, uh, you're gonna need to have different perspectives to be able to, uh, you know, overcome the different situations and to, uh, be able to, uh, so you definitely are gonna start with a, a composition of, of functionality, right? Like you need a pilot, you need a biologist, you need a geologist, you need an engineer that is gonna be in charge of the systems and stuff like that. But beyond that, um, and this is going a little bit more into the humanities aspect of it, what does it mean for us to go to Mars? You know, what does it mean for us as a species to go to Mars and who, who gets to pick them and who gets to, to represent uh, a species in, in a lot of ways? So you, you want to have a, 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 a crew that speaks to that too. Not only, because, uh, not only because of the fact that uh, it's not diversity for the sake of it, it's because it matters and not, not in terms of only of representation, but only on the discourse that's gonna happen, how it's gonna happen. Aaron mentioned the, the term colonization. And even some people have, have uh, some problems with the term settlement uh, when you talk about space exploration because of the history of colonization that happened towards some, some regions. I come from a country that was colonized like from Colombia. So uh, there are some aspects of it that are different. When we were talking with the crew members in, in high seas, uh, some of us that were internationals were talking about our, our challenges, our experiences of doing science being from a country with no space uh, program or some things like that. And some of them that were from the US were saying like, we had no idea. Like we had no idea that you went through this kind of struggle. So I think it is important to, not only because of the functionality of it, like you obviously need diversity in terms of you need science, you need engineering, you need a different perspective. Uh, obviously this crew will need to be able to communicate what they do, not only in a technical level, but also to talk to people because they're gonna be in the history books. So, you know, it's, it's uh, I think it's that part of it, like the humanity of, of going to it. So uh, each crew was different. 
each crew, each experience was different. Very, each one was very valuable. And in terms of how you do science and how you do engineering after doing this, it's very different to think, think about things like being just in a, looking at a screen, looking at a CAD model, but it's different like to being there and being able to experience how it would be and to be able to make mistakes. For example, in one of the EVAs, my PLSS died, <laughs> right? So I, I died on Mars, but so, what, what do you do? What, how, how do you react? You're, you're able to make those mistakes. So, so yeah. Uh, so I, I have first just a tiny clarifying question, which, uh, so you, you said something about a sim that's happening in Russia and you mentioned in va a vacuum environment. Are they doing an analog or a sim in a vacuum in Russia right now? No, no, no. It's okay. a, it's a Sirius. It's in the Sirius uh, facility that was used for Mars 500. So they're running a, okay. a, a sim an, an eight month simulation right now. Yes. Okay, great. Aaron, did you have a question? Did. Um, I can you give us an example of some of the like unexpected things you've learned doing these analog studies? I think that's always really interesting. I know when I've participated in ground tests um something often goes wrong in a in a way that none of us predicted and we learn a lot from it i would say um that for example uh, this is not necessarily like this first part is not necessarily the analog but coming out of it like hearing other people's voices eating fresh food seeing water running uh, it is, it is very interesting. Like it, it, it gives you perspective. Uh, but there's also a part of it that uh, I think it's going to be key and it's food. Uh, you cannot imagine how much a good meal can lift up uh, people's spirits uh, during these missions. Another thing I did uh, with the Colombian crew, uh, well, I was the commander of that crew. So one thing I did was uh, I collected uh, letters and voice recording of their families before we, get, we got into the mission. And halfway through the mission, I, uh, well, we were talking about, uh, we, I, we were at lunch and we were just talking about like, what did you mean? And then I gave them the, the letters and I think all of them started crying. <laughs> like, and I played back the, the, the recordings of their families and it was like a very emotional experience. So I think we, we need to start considering more of this uh, human part of it. Like not only like the, how much CO2, CO2 are you expelling? And uh, you know, how much water are you intaking? But also like this, this uh, uh, emotional part of it. So what were some of the research projects that you were personally conducting on, um, on, on some of these uh, missions? One of them was testing the spacesuit simulator. Uh, so we, we did some like functionality tests. Uh, on, on this new analog we're building, we're gonna be using the 1.5 version of this, of this suit. Uh, so it's more maintainable, more durable. Uh, at high seas, I was doing some human factors um, research related to, for example, training. So I evaluated some activities and uh, watched like how much time it takes to learn it, like to develop a learning curve of doing the activity. So some of them could be trained before you get there. So you get the curve, the learning curve earlier, and uh, that allows you to use better the time in simulation. Um, so yeah, th those kind of things, uh, uh I, I was, I was, uh, doing, and the, the, but there were so like really cool things. For example, one of my crew members, uh, in a high seas brought, uh, aquaponics, like a portable aquaponics, uh, tank. So it was like a small tank with small fish and the, the crops on top. And it was very interesting, like that she was able to perform all that, like, rem like, bring it there and uh, you know make it run like in such an environment it was very interesting 
So I, I have a quick question, but Ada really quick wanted to show you that she has illustrated both of your talks. Um, oh. So the first talk I oh. invited. What's that? I'm gonna show it a little bit. There you go. I invited. Uh, <laughs> I invited planetary protection <laughs> law uh, and. Uh, and he's what? really freaking out about the law. No, a surprise. Friend. <laughs> Whoa. And um, then, uh, well, it's hard to see, but, uh, the second talk I did, um, Mars slash Earth stuff. And mm -hmm. she noted that bacteria was important for both of you, uh, you know, that Aaron was worried about contamination and Oscar was eating freeze-dried food to try to make sure there weren't too many bacteria. So everybody's got bacteria on the brains. Um, yeah, um, and I played um it in the middle of both because it um that's the only life on mars and well, we, the last yeah, yeah we don't know if it's on mars yet but there's that's, still back that's part of what it, well, I, well it's we don't know yet if there's bacteria okay, on mars but it's <laughs> other planets, okay, okay all right well, so so mom's gonna ask well we don't know if there's bacteria on other planets either yeah. we'll talk about that in the car but so uh, so Oscar, my, my question for you is, um, so you've been talking a lot about food. So while I was researching life support systems, a common thing that I came across was a suggestion that uh, when humans go to Mars, for example, uh, maybe our protein source is gonna be bugs, which is totally, which is something that lots of cultures are totally comfortable with, but is a bit uncommon for a lot of Western cultures. Do you feel like bugs are going to be, you know, as, as someone who ran and owned a restaurant and is really into food, do you think bugs are going to be an important part of our diet or do you think we will become vegetarians or does it depend on who the person is? I think, um, again, coming back to the humanities part of it, like how will culture develop, right? I think bugs are going to be a, a, a part of it. Uh, they're very efficient and I think uh, they're going to be uh, like in our near future it's, there's going to be a part of it like like regularly in, in our you know in our food in the restaurants in the groceries shops and stuff I think bugs are going to become a thing in the in the near future and uh, but definitely I mean uh, I, I I would incorporate them and um, there are some things that are necessary and that that go beyond just like the, the fact of supplying, again, the black box, eh, but just the experience of eating. So I think box could be part of that, of that, that experience of, of, of eating. So yeah, I, I am 100% for eating box. <laughs> it, the uh, mealworms were are a common food item in the Lunar Palace Sims, I think. They, they published their meal plans and like uh, roasted with soy sauce mealworms were, were pretty common. And they were, they, part of the report was like rankings of how good the food were and everybody really liked them. So yeah. So I have to say, my, you, you know, my kids have grown up because I, I you know, study insects and, and have often encouraged uh, my students in my classes to, to give insects a try as food. So my kids have grown up with there being insects as food options throughout their lives and they, and they love them. Like my kids genuinely enjoy, if, they're, if mealworms are around, they're like, all right, give me some. They, like they, they, they enjoy them. So I, I, I'm, I'm with you, Oscar. I think it's, it's happening. And it seems like it already is happening. Like, I mean, there are several restaurants in Houston, like pretty high-end restaurants that have- I was gonna say, on the yeah. Yeah. Cricket yeah, powder is becoming a, you know, a more common dietary supplement. I hope it happens. You, are you a bug eater, Aaron? Have you eaten bugs at these restaurants? I have had, yeah, there's a uh, pretty fancy Mexican restaurant that serves um, like sauteed crickets with like little tortillas and you can make yourself a little cricket ta taco and yeah, they're, they're, they're good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ada eats crickets also. She tried them at the Houston Natural Museum of History. But no other bugs. Well, I think it depends Not on what you- mealworms. I think if you had eaten mealworms when you were younger, you would think mealworms were fine. No, I think a lot of it depends no, on no, what no, you start no. with. 
We need we need a whole other dorks on on eating insects. I think that sounds like a promising. Yeah. Topic. We need to find it. What is it? An entomophagist? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. The, the life support people that I've interviewed sort of fall in different camps. Some of them think, you know, if the program is run by Westerners, there's no way bug eating is going to become. Uh, there's no way entomophagy is going to take off, and so they're going to all be vegetarians. And then other people I talk to who themselves are comfortable with eating insects are way more likely to think that that is going to be a common protein source and is a, a potential source of creativity in your diets. And so it's very interesting the different answers you get. And I guess, you know, maybe the people you send up first might sort of like influence the trajectory. So important to think about who's going up there first. Yeah, very much so. So, I, okay, I feel like we're moving sort of into the phase here of questions that kind of span both talks, we've got a little bit of, of time left. Um, and so I, I wanted to ask each of you, uh, Oscar, you, I caught your, your very careful wording at one point. You said, not if I go to space, but when I go to space. <laughs> so I think I already know your answer, but I'm wondering for each of you, if you had the opportunity to go to space or perhaps to go to the moon or Mars, would you do it? I would definitely go. I would for sure go. And uh, I think we are uh, we're living in a time where these opportunities are opening more and more and more. Uh, actually, in the past, uh, IAC, there was a, an astronaut panel. And one of them, um, a, one, of, one of, the, uh, of the participants was one of the past a, Blue Origin uh, crew members, uh, Chris Boshusi, Boshu, I forgot, <laughs> I always forget how to pronounce his last name, but yes, um, Chris. And so he was saying, eh, please raise your hands, like if you want to go eh, to space and like people, like everyone, like in the room, most of people in the room, like raise their hands and they say like, I think that we're in a time where 90% of you who want to go to space will get the chance to go to space. So it was very optimistic uh, and the demography is changing and things are changing. Um, so we'll see, but yeah, I, I would be hundred percent going. I think, yeah, this is a, this, this comes up more often than I, than I would admit in our house uh, as my partner is actually a, a flight controller. She works in emission control. Um, and she has no desire to go to space. She does not want to go. She wants to stay on the ground and help out down here. And I, I think if I was if I was offered the opportunity, I would go. I think it would be a really a really really fun adventure. It would it's, it would definitely be hard. It is it is not glamorous at all. If you if you talk to the astronauts and and folks that have been in space, it, it it's it smells weird. You have no privacy. Um, you know, you have to, you're cooped up in this tiny little space with these people that you may or may not get along with super well for a long time. And it's, and all of those problems are only going to get worse the farther away from earth we go. Um, but I, I think, I think I would, I would give it a shot. Kelly, what about you? Uh, you know, so the more I read about space, the less I want to go. Uh, and for all the reasons that Aaron just mentioned, uh, you know, I think if like a million people had been on space trips and I was like, okay, it's super safe. Maybe I'd want to go up for like a week, like long enough to stop puking. And so I, I know there's no established correlation between people who get motion sickness on earth and people who get space motion sickness. I get motion sickness on earth. My sense is that I would get motion sickness in space because I just that just seems my like my luck. Uh, and so maybe I'd stay for a week, like long enough to look out the cupola and be like, wow, earth looks great. And then I want to go home. But like, I would never want to be gone for a long time because like, there's no chance of discovery. There's almost no chance of discovering a bug that has never been identified on the moon or Mars. And I don't want to live somewhere where there's no chance of finding a new bug. So I'm happy on earth. I like it here. What about you, Scott? That's such an interesting answer. So, I mean, I'm pretty similar to you, Kelly. So I, I, well, I guess I would say I definitely would like to go to space. If I had the chance to just go into low earth orbit, look down at the earth, be in space, I would totally do that. 
for me, the longer missions, the biggest challenge would just be like time away from family, right? Like, I, you know, I do field work as a biologist and teach field courses and it's, it's so much fun to do. It's one of my favorite aspects of my job, but it's always a real challenge to be away from family, even if it's just for a couple of weeks. So if you're talking about like, you know, a mission to Mars where you're going to be gone for two and a half, three years, that might be a deal breaker. But uh, I'm fascinated by exploration and the prospect that you could even if it's not discovering a new critter or life form, just discovering something new in a new place. So that that is very appealing. So I'm really glad there are people like Oscar and like Aaron that are out there that are making it possible for others to be able to go and, and, uh, and do those missions and do them safely and do them responsibly because it's important. Agreed. And Ada talks about being an astronaut sometimes. So maybe, maybe she'll be one of the first people on Mars uh, and I will feel very torn about that. <laughs> I will want her back home on Earth where it's safe. I have my, my zero G indicator ready. <laughs> and I I can't wait to see the photos of, is, that's a toucan, right? No, can. it's, it's a, a um, macaw. macaw. A macaw, yeah. sorry. <laughs> it's a, really? yeah. So, uh, Ada, Ada, sorry, hold on. So, so this has been awesome. Thanks so much to the two of you for your talks. We have upcoming talks. Uh, the next, next week is disease. After that is science and art. And the week after that is light. And so we'll be talking about uh, photonic crystals that bug may, bugs make, tumor microenvironments, Mongolian parasites, uh, fungal themed art. We've got uh, or ecological fiction. We've got some super great stuff lined up for the next couple weeks. Uh, so yeah, we hope folks will continue to join us. And thanks again so much to Aaron and Oscar. This was super fun. I love talking about space. Your talks were epic. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. Anything you want to say, Scott, before we uh, say goodbye? Uh, this is so much fun. Thanks for dorking out with us, Aaron and Oscar, and everybody that was able to join us and send questions as well. See you next time, everybody. Right. Bye. Uh, thanks for organizing this, you guys. This is great. Great. Yeah, thank you for coming. And thanks for thanks for attending in addition to presenting. It's uh, it's great to know people are having fun. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.